AMD's Ryzen series really posed a challenge for Intel, who I don't think were expecting such a formidable and scalable design as Ryzen proved to be. Zen's architecture and chiplets were small, efficient, and using the magic of Infinity Fabric could be connected with yet more Zen chiplets. You could have two Zen chiplets for double the number of cores, or four chiplets for four times the number of cores. You get the idea. Intel's single die approach wasn't quite so scalable, because there's kind of a limit to how large a single chip can get. And you really don't want to get there since as these things get bigger, defects become more of a problem, and so it kind of limits how far Intel's processors could scale in this direction. Add to that the problem with intercore latency. Cores need to communicate with one another. Intel's using either a ring or mesh design, but no matter what they did, the more cores they had, the more latency there was between them, which ultimately presented a trade-off. Intel needed a solution. I can't claim to be an expert on processors, but I know that they take a long time to develop. And I need to say this because judging from some of the comments I've read, it looks like some people think the processors Intel released six months after Ryzen were created with Ryzen in mind, which really isn't how things work. The processors released today could have started their lives five years ago. So with Ryzen released in 2017, I wouldn't be surprised if it has only been with Intel's latest generations that they've actually released processors designed with Ryzen in mind. And it looks like they've gone down a different approach being the P and E core strategy, which is something we've seen in phones and Apple products, but never before in general desktop processors. So while Intel are still manufacturing their processors on a single die, which could still be a huge disadvantage, by having different core types it has helped them to combat AMD's scalable multi-core threat. So Intel's new designs have high performance P cores, which are more like the standard cores we're used to seeing in previous Intel designs, and are indeed kind of like how AMD's Zen cores still are. So these P cores are really fast, have low latency between them, they support multiple threads, and are well suited to things like games where low latency is key. But then Intel also has the efficient E cores. These are slower, simpler types of cores, and they're terrible for things like games because they have such high latency. But it's easy for Intel to cram a lot of these onto the processor, making them ideal for tasks which require lots and lots of cores. I was really fascinated by this design, to think it's a processor of two halves. You could be gaming on the P cores while the E cores are in the background quietly and efficiently dealing with everything else. They could even be rendering a video back there. But the reality of Intel's processors isn't so convenient. For a start, despite the 13,000 series essentially doubling the number of e-cores over what the 12,000 series had, it still isn't enough to pull ahead of AMD's best in terms of thread counts or raw performance. And while it sounds very clean and logical to use the e-cores for some tasks and P for others, in reality, a clear divide like this is rarely the best approach for any sort of task on your PC. And no matter how you cut it, there's nothing stopping AMD's multi-chiplet designs from behaving similarly, and with fewer compromises. And here's the real kick in the teeth. These efficient e-cores, as small as they are and literally standing for efficiency, are not particularly efficient. So what the hell are they good for? And the answer to that is die size. Intel can cram four e-cores into the same space as they can one p-core. So instead of using a space on the die to get one fast core with hyperthreading, Intel can instead have four whole e-cores. So hearing that, it sounds like using e-cores only really benefits Intel and not the consumer. But I'm beginning to see the benefit for us as well. Less so in the high end, but more so lower down the tiers. Take a look at the 13600K, for instance. If it's true that four e-cores take up the same space as a single p-core, then using the same die space, the 13600K could have been an eight p-core processor. But instead, Intel gave up two potential p-cores in exchange for eight e-cores, making it a 6p and 8e design. And you only have to look at benchmarks of it up against AMD's similarly priced 7600X to appreciate how useful these e-cores are for boosting multi-core performance. Intel's 6p cores remain relatively competitive against AMD's 6 cores in gaming, but thanks to Intel's extra 8e cores, it utterly annihilates AMD's processors in activities which benefit from more cores. Their strategy has kind of changed how I perceive cores. Until now, an 8-core processor has been better than a 6-core one. Yet with Intel, a 6-core processor with 8 e-cores is significantly better than having 8 p-cores in almost every workload you can throw at it. So long as it's not an activity that requires more than 6 fast cores. But it seems like this isn't too much of a problem, since it looks like the stuff you do on a computer either benefits from there being a few fast cores or lots of slower ones. And when you look at it like that, Intel's strategy makes a hell of a lot of sense. The tables have turned, and it's now Intel that are combating AMD with more cores and more multi-threaded performance at a given price point. All thanks to how little die space these e-cores occupy. A really interesting situation all round, and great for consumers. Especially once those motherboard and memory presses come down a bit. But what about the future? It looks like Intel could borrow from AMD by gluing their processors together from multiple smaller bits. Aside from that, all this information is just general stuff you'd hope for from a new generation based on an improved node. 
As usual, it's the rumour mill that teases at the most exciting things. I'm beginning to read about Intel's next generation of processors actually having fewer peak cores than they do already. I'll just ask, does it make sense? Well, no it doesn't, does it? Sounds like it's going backwards. You'd at least hope that with fewer peak cores would come more E cores. But I guess the question is, do we really need 8 P cores for anything, or has the large number of E cores alongside it done away with the need for so many fast cores? So if these rumours are true, I guess they'd focus on making these P cores faster, and perhaps even more importantly, to actually make these E cores live up to their name by being more efficient. Because when you've got so many cores, the benefits of efficiency optimizations are greatly multiplied. Meanwhile, on AMD's side of things, details about Zen 5 are even more scarce follow the rumours back and they all seem to stem from the same few places, but I'll just say, with Intel looking to borrow the best bits from AMD's strategy, wouldn't it now make sense for AMD to borrow the best bits from Intel's?